Hello, this is Clarence Moy with Awards Daily, and I am beyond thrilled to be able to present an interview here with Bob Shaw, the production designer of one of my favorite shows, The Gilded Age. Bob, it's incredibly nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I was just, you know, for our listeners, I was just telling you a story that when I first started screening The Gilded Age, I told my wife the number one person I wanted to talk to most of all in the Emmy season was you because of all of what it took had to have taken to get through the to, to design this show i mean I, you know as you as you sit down and start to look at the scripts the stories the locations and you were approached with this project what what went through your head honest reaction to to sort of the the volume of work that had to be undertaken for the series the volume didn't concern me um okay. i've done some projects that were fairly large i mean um boardwalk empire right. there was a lot involved and the Irishman certainly wasn't as exotic in locale as um, the Gilded Age, but there were over 300 locations in, in the film. So, um, you know, scouting is just part of the game. And uh, the first thing is assembling a good team. And uh, I have probably the best location manager in Lori Pitkus. And we, um, we just have a great way of bouncing ideas back and forth. And what I like so much about Lori is she'll say, now call me crazy because sometimes you, you, you'll you never find the, the location complete. You'll find a piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say it's like I would hear when I attempted to play baseball poorly when I was a kid, oh, you got a piece of it because they, they thought they heard the ball barely make contact with the bat. But sometimes it's a doorway. Sometimes it's, um, you know, a roof line. Sometimes it's part of one room. And um, what's uh, really essential uh, to do this kind of project now is to be able to work with your visual effects team and say, you know, I think that 80% of this is here. Can you provide the other 20% or, or, or can we, um, you know, figure this out? And um, that's how the, the business has really changed. And it it's really makes it kind of exciting because it, it opens up more possibilities. So uh, for our viewers, I think we have to share the fact that you are on a location scout for season two, is it? Uh, season two, yeah. Yeah, excellent. So we won't share where because we don't want to spoil any details, but right, uh, right. there's a there's a pretty That's location. why I'm in my car, yes. As, <laughs> as like uh, on any television show, we had like multiple schedule changes during the course of the day. And then uh, I thought I had everything timed perfectly. And then someone was 40 minutes late for the scout because they got lost. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I didn't have time to get to a, a safe place for, to, to talk to you. So uh, you were talking about finding pieces of a location here and there. One of the things I know that you had to do, particularly for the Russell House, was to build the Great Hall. But then the rooms that came off of that were actual locations. I'm thinking more of the, the ballroom and the, and the breakers, right? That the, um, the, the ballroom um, is, is in the breakers. Yes. The main part of the house has the Russell Great Hall. It has the dining room. It has the, uh, the, the drawing room. It has uh, George's office. Um, the things that were added in the first season were uh, the pool table room. The, the smoking room was also in the breakers. And then the ballroom was in the breakers. And when, the first time I met on the show before I even had the job, I said, well, unless you plan on having a ball every week, I wouldn't. I wouldn't build the ballroom mm -hmm. uh, because I knew that the ball would, would figure prominently in the, in the finale of, of season one. Um, it was kind of a gift that Julian really had everything mapped out when we started. So we weren't doing episode one and two and having no idea what was coming our way that we have a little bit more of going into season two. Um, but um, I said, it just, it's too much stage space. Uh, and, and and it's it, it's it's just, it's just not practical, and that we'll find a ballroom, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's what we did. And we we actually matched um, certain elements in our dining room uh, thematically and decoratively uh, to the breakers, so that it would feel more like it was the same same building. So when you're building these sets and you're trying to blend them seamlessly with something that is pre-existing, like the breakers room, I uh, like the breakers. Uh, is it a music room there or is it the, uh, it's actually the music room, but they, they room. used it as the ballroom. Okay. And, uh, you know, some houses had a dedicated ballroom, some didn't. And, uh, 
like the marble house that's what they call the gold room but it's actually rather small and i'm told that most of the time they used it as a sitting room so when you're matching the set that you built to that room in the breakers the music room that becomes the russell's ballroom how do you then go and apply you know, do you have period specific designs that you're applying to the sets that you build so that it looks like so that there is continuity? Sure. There, okay. there are a couple of distinctive features of the, uh, the ballroom at the breakers. Uh, one is that there are columns that stand off from the walls. Um, and we, we duplicated that in our dining room. And then there are sconces that wrap around the column and then sort of stick out into the room as opposed to being mounted to a wall. And those are both very distinctive features that you really don't see in many places. And so that was one of the things we looked at. There was a tremendous amount of ornament on the, um, on the walls. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, in, I'm near traffic. <laughs> so, okay. um, uh, and you can, you, some, some certain things, certain specialty pieces we had sculpted and then molded and, and reproduced, but a lot of other things there are, are catalogs and catalogs of, of, um, of ornament that you can purchase. And, um, it uh, was the job of the set designers. Uh, the main set designer was, uh, was Larry Brown, who's now our art director. And um, I always made the joke about, isn't there anything left in Larry's ornament warehouse? <laughs> because it's like a jigsaw puzzle and trying right. to say, well, if I put these curly cues and then I can use this angel if we like break one of the feet off <laughs> or, or something like that. It's, a lot of it's the accumulation of the tail more than the logic of the detail. Mm -hmm. And it has it has um, an impact that is derived largely from just the amount of detail rather than the logic of it. And you see that when you look at real architecture, too, that that the harmony that we think everything has is, is often not there. It's, it's just a lot of detail piled on top of other detail. So this is probably a very technical question that I, only I would care about. But if you're if you're, a, you know, standing in the Russell ballroom and you cast off to the, I mean, not the Russell, the, the Russell great hall and you cast mm -hmm. off to the left. Are you concerned as a production designer that they, you know, how will you handle the fact that that actual ballroom isn't there? Like, what do you do in terms of a design to make sure that, you know, is it covered in CG or something like that to make sure that they, the viewer never sees the fact that we are in two separate locations? We, we never, uh, well, first of all, we, we played the ballroom as if it were on the second floor, which was also very common in New York ballrooms. And there's really no way, we have two directions to go at the top of the stairs. Oh, right. um, that was a feature that actually sort of worked on a lot. When you look at most mansions, you, you don't see a landing at the top of the stairs. Mm -hmm. um, and someone is sort of revealed bit by bit. You'll see like the lower half of them come into frame and then suddenly they're, they're, the rest of them appears. And I very much wanted to have a, a point of arrival at the top of the stairs. So you can see someone full figure. And um, the plan was really stolen a little bit from the Metropolitan Club, which is another Stanford White design. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have a, a corridor that goes off to the left and one that goes off to the right. And we have in our mind that one side goes to more public space and one side goes to bedrooms, but we've never really had to answer the question. Okay. Uh, and so we, we, we didn't try to do something like have a view where you see part of a chandelier or something like that. Mm -hmm. we, we didn't, we didn't address it that way because we, we thought when you try to get too specific, you can also often trap yourself. So I want to, to, to pull back a little bit and talk more thematically about the production design. Like how are you defining this theme of the old versus the new money through your designs? I mean, clearly there's a lot of different color and, and, and material, um, building materials that are, that are very different between both um, statuses, but how are you reflecting that? Well, something that I said very early on, and then I was, um, I was gratified to hear uh, Julian expressing this when he was explaining the themes to, to another person that basically the old money wanted to be English mm -hmm. and the new money wanted to be French. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of it in a nutshell. So when you think of the dark woodwork and the heavier look uh, of the, the Brook Van Rijn house, 
um, they are much in the English tradition. There's definitely dialogue in the in the show about when the table is laid in the English manner versus when it's you know laid in a different manner. One of my favorite and, scenes. I'd like to talk about the kitchens. The kitchens are, I, I just recently remodeled, uh, I didn't myself remodel it, but we remodeled our kitchen here. And, and so I'm, I'm fascinated by all the subway tile in uh, the Russell's kitchen. Talk to me about the differences between the, the Van Rijn and the Russell's kitchen. Well, there was a lot more speculation involved in figuring out the Van Rijn kitchen because there wasn't a lot of research. There were a lot of photos of the, just the corner where the stove was. And I relied upon a friend who um, has a brownstone on West 75th Street in Manhattan, who's the third owner. So when she first purchased the house, it was less um, altered than, than those houses would normally be. Um, but it was just darker, the ceilings were lower, and um, you definitely didn't get any sense of opulence from being, from being in the kitchen area. Um, we sort of created the, the, the communal area where uh, the servants take their meals and whatnot. I mean, that's, that's speculation more than anything based on hard facts. We know that there, were, there was a kitchen, there were, there were bedrooms for a certain amount, number of the staff on the ground floor, um, but a little bit more invention there. The Russells, we, and we had built where he had designed a, a, a a kitchen to build on stage. And I, I toured several Newport mansions and a lot of other places. And it was considered to be most modern to um, have tile. And it was considered to be more hygienic and more uh, easy to clean. Mm -hmm. And they went to the point of even tiling the ceiling, which just seems crazy. <laughs> um, this was before they later discovered that um, grout in tile, particularly when it's not sealed, is the perfect medium for contagion. <laughs> <laughs> they they um they no longer i i think there's there's some idea they thought it was as clean as an operating room you know and um i see my thumb over the picture i didn't even realize that um that uh they, they thought it was like making it op operating room clean mm -hmm. and you, they don't do that in operating rooms they haven't for years because it's really not sanitary because of everything that grows in in the grout um but it was what they thought was the most modern at the time. And it's, it's a much bigger kitchen. It has dedicated rooms. They have a flower arranging room. They have a pastry room. They, they, have, uh, they probably have a wine cellar somewhere that we haven't seen. Um, but uh, we filmed that. We ended up filming it in the Elms uh, in Newport because um, it, uh, it was there. And they were very open to us using it. And um, again, building that giant tiled kitchen uh, was going to be you know, prohibitively expensive. If, if with as much money as we spent, <laughs> it, um, there are always limits. And there's a certain point where it's just, well, this is just taking it too far. Obviously, the production design extends beyond the houses of the Van Rijn's family and the uh, Van Rijn Brooks family, I should say, and the Russells. You also extend into the black middle class with the Scott's uh, family. And then of course you see examples of tenements. I wanna talk about the, um, the Scott's house. How did you determine what would be the design for that and what that would look like? Well, um, the, the whole Scott storyline really evolved a lot over the, over the production. Um, process. And uh, we had a lot of input put from um, historians and experts that we contacted. One particular, you know, Dr. Erica Dunbar, who um, teaches at Rutgers, I believe. Um, and um, she, uh, because there was already a storyline that Mr. Scott owned a pharmacy and that, that they were prosperous, because it's one of the very important and I think very interesting plot points in season one when, when Marion, uh, makes the very embarrassing assumption that they're poor because they're because they're black and when she brings the you know the hand-me-down shoes and um you know erica was the one who said no there really was a thriving you know uh black upper middle class that was referred to as the black elite and that they're very rarely um represented in 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 most film or, or television or, or or fiction in general and so it was decided that um that was an interesting um, take on the, on the family. And so a lot of it had to do with uh, looking for a house that seemed the right 
economic level for them being well to do, but not being wealthy and um, being a sort of an upper middle class family in Brooklyn. And it's, it's really just that their, their brownstone's just a little smaller than, than some of the others that we see. And then, of course, you've got uh, the tenements that I can't remember the name of the character, but so the, the one of the... Um, it's Mrs. Armstrong's mother. Yes, Mrs. Armstrong's mother. She lives in a tenement. There are still tenement museums. So did you draw from um, those in, in New York or how did you design that? Um, you know, I'd actually done a tenement before or, or more than once on other shows and um, I was familiar with the tenement museum and that the... the um, the, the terrible thing was that there were long, thin railroad uh, spaces that didn't have a lot of light, didn't have really any ventilation, and um, had a middle, usually would have a middle room that had no light or windows at all. And so I was sort of familiar with that. And um, the interesting thing there was that we, um, we chose a space that we altered and sort of turned into, um, I, I have no idea who that is. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think they were calling me. Um, and we had to, uh, I guess, the, I guess school must be out. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, we built it on the ground floor and we put a sort of tenement um, air shaft backing outside the window, which was actually sitting on the sidewalk in Troy um, because it was just easier for us to alter this ground floor space. Um, but uh, we actually, we put a divider in, we, it, was, it was a practical location. We put two divider walls in it to sort of break it into that sort of little rabbit warren of rooms that you would see in a tenement. Um, although for, it was the way tenements were, it would actually be really luxurious for somebody to be living in that much space by themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, the funny thing is the, um, the, the alley that Mrs. Armstrong goes through on her way to her mother's, um, we had we needed the location we hadn't found it we were um uh we'd been all around troy but we hadn't really been in the area that i would say was on the other side of the tracks so i was in the office late one night and i always say i i, I was google driving around troy and i happened to find this gap between two buildings that that, that became the entrance to the tenement oh wow um but uh it was a different kind of scouting now to, to google drive around the city and then say stop <laughs> i think i found it <laughs> And um, I, I said to Lori the next day, I said, I think I found something. And she said, well, let me have someone go check it out. And we, we uh, saw it, liked it and signed it up. You know, talking about Troy, New York, I recently read that they, the Age of Innocence did quite a bit of filming there mm -hmm. as well when they were shooting. In fact, it's, it's right there behind me, one of my very favorite movies. Um, what is it about Troy that, that opens itself up to such specific period uh, filming? Oh, when things slowed down in, in, in Troy, they, they pretty much stayed slow. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the most prosperous cities in the country uh, prior to the Civil War. And that was because it was the confluence of so many waterways and the canals. So it was this hub for, for, for uh, all sorts of commerce. And then when the railroads came in, and there was a different way to transport all this uh, goods, um, the waterways were not uh, as essential, certainly the canals were not as essential and, and eventually sort of stopped being used. And um, Troy didn't change. Nobody then knocked down a big section of Troy and um, put high rise apartments or something like that. Mm -hmm. So for example, we hubbed around Washington Park. The one thing you learn is that if there's one park in a city, the odds of it not being Washington are fairly slim. <laughs> um, and the houses on around the perimeter are, are much earlier than you would find if you were looking in New York or in Brooklyn or something like that, mm -hmm. because there are houses from the 1830s, the 1840s, the 1850s. So what is unique about Troy is there's a lot of housing stock from a much earlier period. I mean, within relatively speaking, this country, um, because in, in Manhattan, in, in New York City, there's almost a cutoff date. There's not much before 1890 uh, or, or very few things. And here's this wealth of things, all of which are before the Civil War. And um, when, when you're designing something, it's you always have to remember that whatever the latest fashion is, whatever is the hot thing that defines the era, most people don't have it. <laughs> and um, most people are living 
10, 20, 30, or even more years behind the times. And so uh, particularly with the, the number of old Knickerbocker, old money characters, they would live in much older homes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what was one thing that was really great about Troy. You mentioned the trains and I, I have to ask within the context of the show, within the course of the show, some misfortune befalls the Russell family in terms of a, 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 a train accident. Um, and you had to recreate that scene. Tell me about recreating that, that you know, unfortunate train incident. Well, with most things, we started uh, for looking for reference. And um, there were um, a lot of photographs to be found of early unfortunate train disasters or train, train wrecks. And um, we, we, we made a certain number of pieces of a train and then the rest of it was computer generated. Mm-hmm. So um, we, we made a train car, sort of smashed it up and sort of started tossing it around the hill and, um, and then had a, a couple pieces from another piece of train that were, that were intact. And then the, the length of the car was extended with visual effects. And um, uh, Sally Richardson would fail to direct it. It was very, had a very clear uh, scheme in mind where she wanted the train to be, you know, high, like on a trestle or, or the edge of a hill. That way she could shoot most of her coverage into the hill and where the practical um, rubble and refuse was, and then only have a limited number of, um, of shots that required the, the computer generated train. Uh, so it was a lot of planning on that one. There was a model made there were renderings done, uh, you know, a lot of, um, it's, uh, it's one of those things where we always have to deal with what is, what is true and what is believable. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the actual, uh, train uh, mishaps were so horrific that, um, when you saw what the train looked like, some of them literally sheared in half or the, the entire top of the train sheared off. It just seemed too, it seemed pushing it too far for us, or it seemed that people, if people would question whether it's real, you, you want to stay away from that. I mean, even with the t- interior details, there are certain things. Um, we shot in um, the, the Gould Mansion in, in Tarrytown, uh, Lindhurst, uh, and they have these very elaborate radiators. And I talked to the curator, who was incredibly helpful, um, about the radi- radiators. And She's so proud of Jay Gould. It's like she's a relative. And she, oh, Mr. Gould was very forward thinking and he had so many things. Kristen, uh, Silver's her name, um, had so many things before everyone else did. Um, but sometimes if we put a radiator in, in certain homes, people would stop and say, do they have those yet? And you don't want people to drop out of the story in order to, to question the background or to pause the pause the, uh, the the action and start googling uh, which happens when we were on when I did boardwalk um, we would stay away from anything that involved chain link or cyclone fence and because people thought it just felt wrong well it had been around for 50 years by 1920 but we avoided it because we thought people would question it right I feel like I could ask you 35 more questions, but I won't do that to you because I know you're in the middle of, of a location shoot. And well, you have all, all this bit of my head, my thumb, <laughs> half of my head, you know. But uh, I, I do have one more question and it is in relation to something you just said about using VFX to supplement the, the train uh, mm-hmm. accident. Um, what is your relationship as a production designer to VFX? And I'm thinking, you know, for one thing, I did not realize, I think until I heard it was either you or someone on the HBO podcast for the Gilded Age talk about that the hand of the Statue of Liberty was not actually a, a some sort of crafted statue. It was actually a, a CG. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was astounded by that. And then I believe part or if not all of the New York Times building when it was lit with by Edison's light, that is also yeah, CG. Yeah. Yeah. How do you how do you partner with the the VFX teams to make sure that their designs are accurate? In my experience, it gets better and better all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it would be 12 or 13 years ago when we did the pilot for Boardwalk Empire, there were set extensions and we gave them pencil drawings of what the rest of it looked like. 
and um, things have progressed so far, both in the VFX world and in the art department, that now we have people who will do a 3D model mm. of what the building looks like and give that to, um, to visual effects. Um, but whenever possible, we try to, to choose a real building. And then if it needs to be modified, it's still going to be more successful for them to start having photographed or LIDAR scanned a real building. And then, you know, if we need to change the roof, if we need to make some changes, uh, it always ends up more successful than just wholesale rendering a building from scratch. And um, that's something I sort of learned during the course of prepping this show. Um, that uh, the, the, whenever you can give them something real to model, uh, it, it, you're just going to have a better result. But we, you know, we're in constant contact with them. And... Um, always touching base and how do you think we should handle this? And I was thinking maybe we'll do that. Do you think this will work? And um, that uh, re the relationship between the art department and the visual effects department has improved and, and grown and uh, been much more, I hate to say synergistic or, but we really, we work together very closely and constantly because it used to be that we would sort of finish the movie and then wonder what they were going to do. Right. I mean, seriously. And it's, it's not like that at all anymore. Excellent. Well, Bob uh, Shaw, this has been a, a tremendous interview. Thank you for giving me. Sorry. Sorry oh, it's been fun. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you and for fulfilling my uh, Emmy wish this season. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, we, and, we had an amazing team. We had, you know, Laura Ballinger Gardner is like just the best art director and Regina Graves. It, there's no one better as a set decorator and we were very fortunate that everyone was so interested in working on the show that we were able to get the best people because they just wanted to be involved and certainly a lot of that had to do with julian and downton abbey and we even had one scenic artist who wanted to work on the show and knew there was going to be a lot of uh, faux finishes and marbling and mm -hmm. took it upon herself to go do a, a six-week course of uh, decorative painting and marble study in france in the summer before before starting the show wow yeah. I always tell our scenic artists that if there were a marble Olympics, they would be the gold medal winners <laughs> because well, um, they just so such great work. I mean, so many people doing good work. It really, it, you know, it, it takes a lot of people and uh, we, we really had so many great contributors to the product. And it all comes together seamlessly on the show. Yeah. It looks beautiful. <laughs> I hope so. Anyway, well, nice to talk to you. Great to talk to you too, Bob. Thank you so much. Okay, okie doke. Bye-bye.